How has China's attitude on tall buildings, tall building design and development, how has it changed? Because this tall building boom in China has been going on for a long time. What do you think is new about it? You know, I've been uh, working in China since 2010. So this last kind of six years, it's, it's kind of a, a good question because it's a faint thing that's going on. If you come to China and go to virtually any city, there's big buildings being built everywhere. And tall is always going to have a part to play in the density that's required within China. Where we've seen the change start to maybe move in a different direction is in super talls. There's super talls dotted all over China. But I think increasingly the financial constraints of producing a super tall building or the financial rationale of why is a super tall being built, when that's applied to the filter of second and third tier cities, I think questions are being asked. So I think there's a generation of super talls that will be built. I think for some locations, they may be viewed as landmarks, but with questionable financial performance. Whereas in tier one cities, we think we're gonna continue to see really tall buildings continue to be part of what, what happens. And it's because of financial performance. I mean, a high rise uh, urban office building in Shanghai makes a lot of sense as a practical solution based on how the infrastructure works, how the city works, and how the financial performance works. But in a second or a third tier city, I guess their main motivator would be they want to put themselves on the map. They want the attention That's of right. having a super tall building. So then it gets into the question of, it's great that you're a landmark, great that you're on the map, but who are your tenants? Who is going to pay the rent to justify all the cost, time, expense that it took to put that building up? That's where we scratch our heads as developers. We said, that doesn't really make sense to us from a financial perspective. Maybe the longer term view says that in 30, 40, 50 years, it does make sense. I think the, the, the classic rebuttal is always the Empire State Building. Hmm. When the Empire State Building was built, it didn't make money. It didn't make money for a long time, hmm. right? It was built during the, the beginning of the, of the Depression. Um, now here it is many, many years later, the Empire State Building makes money. Maybe our American viewpoint might be a little stilted and that if you say these super talls are going to be there for 100 years, maybe the horizon for financial performance stretches out a lot longer than kind of current pressures would, would apply. Do you think super talls today are being designed with a 100-year timeline in mind? You know, I would, uh, I would hope so. I mean, un undertaking to put one of these buildings up is uh, it's a phenomenal channeling of human and, and, and real resources to build it. So I would hope that that's the horizon that it's 100 years and beyond. That, uh, all those resources that you mentioned, they're coming from all over the world right. these days, of course. I mean, a building, not even super tall, just a high rise in China can have, or in any country, can have investors from five different countries. It can have an architect in one country and developer in another and a local crew. How do you think all that global influence uh, can be best channeled so that the building ends up meaning something to the city it's actually in. So it's not the same as every other city, so it's not reflecting some vested interest in New York so that it's important, or any city for that matter. Right. So that's important for the city that it actually is being built in. Right, I think, you know, I think we, we had a lot of conversation on this at the last uh, conference about is that, a, is that a real concern? And I think um, the answer that we see is, again, it goes back to financial performance. Uh, the global market knows what's performing and what's not performing. So the standard by which you, you can measure real estate performance financially ends up being a very equal conversation now around the globe. Maybe it was a bit more disjoint 10 years ago, mm -hmm. but today, you know, Chinese investors are bringing money into the United States, into Europe. Why are they doing that? because they're seeking performance. They can see that there may be limitations on putting their money to work in China, but if they put their money to work in Europe and the US, they can achieve a, a more uh, attractive financial return. So that 
I, I think there was a fear at one time that from, say, a design perspective, that a building would land in Chicago, that people would say, that doesn't look like an American building. Or the equal concern, that buildings are being built all over China that don't look Chinese enough. I think those issues have kind of flown away a bit. I think it's, it's a concern that the product that gets built is being built at this point by a truly international uh, group of developers, designers, engineers, and builders who are working with a degree of commonality across the globe. So the product itself, I don't think that's an issue. And I think the markets are the, are the thing that really drive um, the global nature of building high rises and super high rises around the world. Mm -hmm. The markets are smart. They know what works and they're going to continue to follow kind of what works. That makes sense, but as markets follow what works and, and chase financial returns as, as they have to and as they're designed to do, do you worry that there's any risk to planning of cities, to the urban context or the urban habitat as it's referred to as CTBUH? Maybe this building as makes sense financially as a massive mixed-use complex with this much parking or this tall of a hotel, but does the city really need that? What do you think the concerns are there, or as a developer, what's your responsibility to the city? Well, you know, I think most uh, of the top cities around the world have equally top planning protocols in, in place. Um, when you think about a place like New York that has this relatively short-term rise of this phenomena of super tall residential buildings. Mm -hmm. Th that question has kind of come back in in a very big way in terms of public discussion. Do we need these things? Are they right? Are they uh, good neighbors? Are they good citizens in, in a place like New York? Uh, what if they're all bought by foreign owners and are actually left vacant most of the year? Are they consumers of of infrastructure and services uh, without any return to the local uh, situation. I, I think some of that's a bit misguided uh, or misplaced. How so? Um, I, I, I think it's what we see is that there continues to be a dialogue about what are the right models for urban planning around the world. I know since we have been in, in working in, in Shanghai in China, We've been involved enough with some short-term uh, dialogue with people in different planning roles within the Shanghai city government who have honestly brought us in to look at plans where they're looking at kind of this overall fabric of the city and saying from a developer's point of view, what do you think we have right? What do you think we have wrong? You know, and Shanghai, I think, is a, is a fascinating case study with the Puxi side that has this certain density that developed from the 20s and the 30s in the French concession and Wangpu district. You see a certain um, degree of urbanism that exists there. You see an alternate way of how it's done in, in Pudong, in the Lujiajue area. Which was developed and a lot more recently. Like exactly. East of the river. So what we see now is that there were lessons learned from Lujiajue that are actually drawing from some of the old elements from Pudong that are being talked about now. So th critical issues of, of the fabric of the city like the street grid. How big are the streets? What's the density of the streets? How, what's the spacing of the streets? All of these things begin to, to change the kind of the look and feel of the urban environment. And we see that planning departments around the world are smart enough to talk to each other. Uh, again, uh, the, the planning side starts to understand what works and what doesn't work. And the planning officials are also equally open to looking at what are best practices. Where are things succeeding? What, is, you know, what was good about residential development in Vancouver that made sense that got transferred down to a city like San Francisco? We did work in San Francisco. A lot of the planning principles that um, led to some of the residential condo developments that are going on now in San Francisco, had some inspiration from, from Vancouver. So 
there's a lot going on, again, globally. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's one of the real themes of, that we see. You know, we're a global developer, but all of these issues um, end up being global issues. It's a truly global industry. Uh, whether you're talking about planning, you're talking about financial investment, you're talking about the work of design professionals, it's all happening in a global atmosphere. It's a good point about learning from other cities. So I wonder, China specifically, what aspects of, of China's urban habitat, of planning of cities in China, are ahead of the curve that other cities should be learning from around the world? And, and in what ways is it still behind the times? I, I think uh, the biggest thing that we notice and that we feel and we appreciate about developing in Shanghai is, uh, or, and across really any city in China, is the commitment to infrastructure, commitment to public transit, commitment to putting in the basic an amenities of, of road systems and utility systems so developers have confidence that they can move into an arena and they're not going to be wondering if that subway line is going to be built in 10 years mm. because it's probably going to get built in two years, <laughs> like the government promised, rather than something that is maybe way out on the horizon. So we think China, and, and again, the linkage between infrastructure and planning and kind of, uh, again, a global recognition of transit-based urbanism developing across China, we think it's a great thing. Mm -hmm. How about any ways in which China really needs to pick up pace in developing or adapt its, its views? Any ways in which urban planning in China is falling behind or maybe phrased a little less uh, pejoratively in a way that they could learn from another city? Well, again, I, I think uh, exactly the conversation about um, not being afraid to uh, look at different models uh, you know, there's been dialogue within China since we've been here that starts to move away from some of the ideas that, that maybe um, you've, you've seen in other China cities, even Shenzhen or, or you know, Lu Jiajui in Shanghai. There were things that were done there that had a certain um, basis for it being completed, and it, it's raised certain issues operationally now that it's, you know, 15, 20 years old. Like what? Well, th things like um, the road network in Lu mm -hmm. It's not particularly the most pedestrian-friendly environment to walk around sure. in. Sure, I've been there. It's, it's like four eight-lane highways with and you overpasses. And you kind of feel you know, a little fearful walking around. If you contrast that to, to maybe walking around areas of the French concession in Shanghai, you say, wow, this is really different. And, and, and why is it different? And a lot of that relates to the, the street grid. Um, China is great at seeing problems, diagnosing problems, and moving to solutions. So that we see that that begins with dialogue, and that we've been able to have some dialogue at times about these types of issues. as something as basic of, hey, when we look at an area, why don't we talk about the, the street grid first, and everything else that comes with setbacks, uh, lot line development, street wall requirements, there's a whole package of tricks that planners can obviously bring into the land use in China that can shape where developers go. And we see that they, that they know that and they acknowledge it and they um, are willing to, to learn and move forward. Mm -hmm.